Last week we began 1 Peter chapter 5, and I started with an example of why, what sheep were and why sheep needed a shepherd. Do you recall that? Right? Sheep aren't exactly the most independent of all the livestock. Sheep aren't exactly the smartest of all the livestock. And I've often thought to myself, that's kind of insulting. Has anybody else ever thought that? Like when, when God describes us as sheep, and you understand what sheep are, you think, well, maybe this is a little bit insulting. And, you know, I, as I meditated and pondered on that this week, um, in studying for what we are going to come about today, I thought, it's very appropriate that God would describe us as sheep. Because it does help us keep a lowly mind and a humble perspective and to not become too independent, but rather to be dependent upon God. And within the local church, God has established a system of order. And the system of order is that Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd over the entire church. But in every local church, there are shepherds who have been tasked with the responsibility to lead and care for the sheep. And then there are sheep who have a responsibility to the shepherd, to Jesus Christ, and to one another. And so last week, as we looked at the role and responsibility of the shepherds, who are also called elders, who are also called pastors, as we looked at the responsibility of that man or those men and the office that they hold, Today, we want to look at the, the contrast, which is the sheep. Who are the shepherds to care for? And, and that would be all of you. You are the sheep. Let's take a look at this entire passage. I'm going to read beginning in verse 1 of chapter 5, all the way down through verse 7, so that we understand the whole context. Peter writes to the church and says this, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now here's the verses for today, verse 5. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble." Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Here is the responsibility of shepherds to sheep, and sheep to shepherds, and sheep to one another, explained in the local church. And so what are we going to look at today? Part two, we're going to begin with this. Sheep must submit to your elders. Sheep must submit to your elders. Now, interestingly, in verse 5, the entire interpretation of this phrase depends on um, how you understand one particular word, and that is younger. Who are the younger sheep? In your, if you have a New American Standard Bible, it says, you younger men, um, I think the New International Version also says younger men. The English Standard Version, I believe, gets it right. It says, those who are younger submit to the elders. And this is a very important uh, distinction to understand. This word, translated younger men in the New American Standard Bible, is a masculine plural noun in the Greek language. And without getting too complex into the Greek language, masculine plural nouns can refer to either a group of men or it can refer to a group that includes mixed company, namely men or women. So the most common masculine plural noun that you find in the Greek New Testament is the, the word anthropos. And it's often translated mankind. And that's not sexist, okay? The word mankind literally means all men and all women, okay? 
And, and so that's the most common masculine plural noun that's translated in the Greek New Testament. This noun is also a masculine plural noun, and it can refer to either young men or to those who are younger in the church. And it seems to me, when you study the context of this passage, that it makes more sense to understand it not as limited to just young men, but as to referring to those who are younger in the church. Now, let's add some more definition to this word. In the English, we have younger. In all the English versions, we have the word younger. But in Luonida, which is a Greek lexicon that defines words, they, they define this word as someone who has uh, a little bit of experience or who has not been in existence for a long period of time. So they're giving a much greater flavor and a much greater nuance to this word. I think it would almost be better to translate this word, um, those who are inexperienced submit to elders. You follow what I'm saying? Those who are inexperienced submit to our elders. And the reason that inexperienced makes more sense than younger is because of the contrast. It, the way your English Bible is laid out right now, it makes it seem like elders are old men and the younger are young men. But are elders necessarily old men? What did we learn last week about elders? Does that refer to age at all? No. Not necessarily. It refers to their office. It refers to their qualification. It refers to their standing within the local church. And so because elders refers to a man's qualification and his office, then younger, this word, must contrast that. It must stand in contrast to that. And so the elder is one who is experienced in the faith. The elder is one who is mature in the faith. The elder is one who has met the 20 qualifications listed in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1 that would qualify him to serve as a pastor over the flock. So the elder is a man who is not new to the faith. The elder is a man whose faith has been tested, who has been proven faithful. And he could be 35 or 37 like me or 67 or 70. It could be any of those ages if he has been proven faithful and meets the qualification. So these who are younger, it makes sense that they are the ones who are inexperienced in the faith rather than just being merely young in age. And think about why this would be really important in a local church. Uh, imagine the context, okay? The gospel is being preached all over the known world. That's the Roman Empire at this time. And you have people who are getting saved at every phase of life. So you have 30-year-olds getting saved, 40-year-olds getting saved, 50-year-olds getting saved. And they're brand new believers in Christ. And what do they do when they get saved? They come into the local church. Now, let's say that you're 50 years old and you're very successful in your career. You're a powerful man in the community. But what do you know about church? What do you know about the things of God? Not very much, right? Comparatively little. And so this is a command to those who are inexperienced in the faith to submit to their leaders, to submit to the elders. And I believe this is very important because those who come into the church and who maybe have a great deal of respect and power in the secular world, they may want to assert their power in the local church. They may come into the church and they should say, you know what, uh, we should do things differently now. I'm here. We should do things differently because this is how I do it in my business or this is how I conduct life in my family or in the military, this is how we do things. Whether it's somebody who is inexperienced in the faith or truly somebody who is young, 
I believe that it's important for these to submit to their elders. I believe that's what Peter is communicating here. You who are younger, likewise, be subject to your elders. And this word likewise is an important word in the text. Why? Because it refers back to verse 1, where Peter begins his exhortation to those who are in the church. I exhort the elders of the church. Instead of repeating himself, he says, likewise. You could almost uh, uh, put that phrase right back in the text. I exhort you who are younger, be subject to your elders. Peter is still discussing how individuals in the church relate to one another and how they act appropriately in the household of God. Peter says this, those who are inexperienced in the faith must learn to submit. Those who are inexperienced in the faith must learn to submit. Why is this important? Why is submission important? Well, in case you haven't noticed, one of the main themes in this book is the topic of submission. All of chapter 2, half of chapter 3, and now here in chapter 5, Peter discusses this topic or this theme of submission. Why does he write about it so much? He writes about it because submission is one of God's favorite themes. Submission is something that was established and ordained by God. Because God is the supreme authority over all of creation, and God has determined that there will be various sub-authorities under him. And each individual person is responsible to submit to the authority that they find themselves under. We call this the spheres of authority. There's a sphere of governmental or civil authority. That's a large sphere. Then there's a smaller sphere of church authority. There's a smaller sphere yet of authority within the household. A smaller sphere yet of authority that's within the household that fathers and mothers have over their children. And in each different uh, relationship that you have in life, you must learn to submit to the appropriate authority. And so Peter writes this command to those who are inexperienced in the faith so that when they come into, into the church, they don't cause disruption, but rather they produce unity. That's the goal of submission, right? So that unity is produced amongst the people, not chaos, not confusion. Now, what is submission? We should define this again. It's always important to understand and to be reminded of this important concept. Submission is the voluntary yielding of your will to that of another. And just think, in the example that I gave, how hard it would be for somebody who is very successful in the secular world to come into the church and to not have a final say on how things are run. That's hard, isn't it? That's challenging. And yet, that's exactly the order that God expects his people to follow. And this is important for inexperienced and new converts because they don't yet know the depths of the word of God. They don't know the complexities of the truth of the scriptures. They are learning, but they are yet inexperienced. And this is why in one of the qualifications to become an elder, Paul writes, don't put any man forward too soon. Don't pick an inexperienced man to be an elder because maybe he doesn't have that um, life experience of practicing his faith for a long period of time. Maybe he doesn't have adequate time to know and understand the scriptures. It could result in him having an inflated view of himself. We call that pride. And then he would lead the church astray. And so inexperienced sheep must learn to submit to their elders. And this is the object of the submission. Submission is commanded in relationship to the elders. Now, why is this? 
Well, elders have been given a, spe a special and specific task to carry out. Hebrews 13, 17 says this, that elders have been charged with keeping watch over your soul. It's our responsibility to make sure that your soul is secure. Not that we are keeping you uh, from losing your salvation, but we are watching over your soul so that no spiritual decay or spiritual rot or sin creeps in and causes you to make a shipwreck of your faith. That's the context in which we watch over your soul. We are like a lighthouse helping you to avoid crashing on the, on the rocks of sin and despair. Acts chapter 20, verse 29, says that elders protect the flock from ravenous wolves. If it's not bad enough to fight your own tendencies to sin and your own lusts and your own desires that you're, you have to put to death day after day, you have ravenous wolves who want to come in and devour the sheep. Elders must watch out for the ravenous wolves. The next verse, Acts 20.30, says that elders must protect the flock from false teachers. So not only are there ravenous wolves, but there are false teachers. We're going to learn next week that Satan himself is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The elders have to protect the sheep uh, from Satan, our enemy. Furthermore, what our brother David read this morning from Ephesians chapter 4, 11 and 12, elders have a responsibility to teach the saints and to equip them to do the works of the ministry. This is a lofty task. It's not a light task. It's a heavy task. And elders have been given this particular commission and responsibility. And so those who are inexperienced must recognize the great task that elders have and willingly submit to the elders. It makes leading that much easier when the sheep are willing to follow. And I praise God that in this church, we have sheep that are willing to follow the elders. We have sheep that support the elders. We have sheep who care for the elders. We have great sheep in this church. But you know what? You don't become a great sheep overnight. You work at it. You grow. You practice this submission. Elders have a responsibility to lead and to guide the sheep. And sometimes, even if you can't see how the situation will pan out, you should trust the elders. You should trust their experience. You should trust their wisdom. Maybe you haven't seen it pan out before, but most likely they have. And they're relying not only on the faithfulness of God, but on the truth of God's word and the richness of their experience in leading sheep as they give you advice on how to live your life. Now, I recognize that not everybody trusts their elders. And if that's the case, you have to ask yourself, why? Why don't I trust my elders? Well, there could be there could be fault on the part of the elders or there could be fault on the part of the sheep. Sometimes elders have violated their sacred trust to shepherd well. I think we are all familiar with churches who have had pastors and elders who have not shepherded the church well, who have made unwise and unbiblical decisions and has resulted in harm in the church. We have also known testimony of elders who were in it for the wrong reasons who were not fit or qualified to be elders. And maybe they even became false teachers or were revealed to be false teachers at a later point in time. And when we, we hear those stories, it causes us to distrust elders as an entire class of people instead of just that one elder or those few elders who sinned in that way. And so, yes, it's true. Elders sin. Elders make mistakes. Elders violate their sacred trust. But if the elders of this church haven't done that, there's no reason to withhold your trust from them. 
Don't take the sins of somebody else and place them on the individual who is serving at this church. So there's one aspect of why elders may not be trusted. Another aspect is this. It could be a you problem. Are you generally distrustful of authority? Are you a headstrong individual who believes it's my way or the highway? Are you somebody who says, you know, I just have to learn all my lessons the hard way? If that's you, and that's the reason why you're not trusting the elders, that's a you problem, and that's sin that you need to confess. Perhaps an unwillingness to trust your elders reveals a greater issue. And that could be an unwillingness to trust God and to cast your cares upon Him. These are some situations that arise in a local church. These are real things that we deal with as a congregation. And we should search and examine our hearts to see if they be true of us. And if we have sin, we must confess and repent. And God will be faithful and cleanse us from that sin. As believers, as sheep, we must submit to our elders, not just those who are inexperienced sheep, but those other verses that I referenced refer to all the sheep. But especially inexperienced sheep must learn to submit. And so I would say this in conclusion. If there isn't a reason to distrust your elders, then the default position that you should take should be to entrust them and then to obey and follow their counsel and their leading and their guidance. That should be the default so Peter has now, in chapter 5, given an exhortation to the elders. And in chapter 5, verse 5, the first half of that verse, he gives an exhortation to the inexperienced sheep. And now, at the second half of verse 5, and on into verse 6, and in verse 7, he gives an exhortation to all the sheep. And this is where we as elders are identified in the same way as you. We are all sheep who must learn to practice humility to one another. Why are the elders sheep? Because we are under the chief shepherd. And so we must be leaders in practicing and growing in humility. Listen to what Peter says. And all of you, notice that word all is important. All of you, the elders, the inexperienced sheep, and every other person who's in the congregation, all of you, Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Sheep, we must practice humility. We must practice humility. Humility should be the characteristic that governs our interpersonal relationships. Think about what should govern our interpersonal relationships. It is this concept, this virtue of humility. All believers must practice and grow in this essential virtue. Notice, Peter says, clothe yourselves with humility. It's so appropriate to preach this on a Sunday morning because typically on a Sunday morning is when everybody dresses their best or it's their most dressed up that they get during the week, okay? Now, to clothe yourself means to adorn yourself with some sort of garment, and the garment that you are going to adorn yourself with is visible to all, most notably yourself. And so I would be willing to bet that every one of you, maybe minus some of you teenage guys, I don't know, maybe you did this, all right? You checked your clothes before you left the house this morning, right? You did make sure that your shirt is organized correctly, that your tie is straight, that, you know, there's no dirt on your pants, none of that stuff. You check your clothes before you leave the house this morning, and I bet that if you used the bathroom while you were here at church, you checked your clothes again. Your clothing is visible to all, including yourself, and that is how the virtue of humility should be for every believer. It should be obvious that an individual is a humble individual. And so, you know, there's this phrase that people use about humility, and I just think it's totally misplaced. People say this, if you think you're humble, then you're really not. I just have a real problem with that because that's not at all how we should understand the virtue of humility. 
The virtue of humility is just like any other fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Would you ever say, if you think you're loving, then you're not? Would you ever say, do you think you're patient? If you think you're patient, then you're not? No, we would never say that about other virtues, but somehow we choose to say that about humility. And so we should not have this attitude of, I can't think about my humility. I can't think about my growth in this virtue because then maybe I'm not humble. No, on the contrary, we should be very conscientious of the virtue of humility. We should be very mindful of how we are growing in this essential Christian attribute. In fact, when Christ described himself, he used two words, humble and gentle. And so if Christian means little Christ, what should be one of the main characteristics that describe you? Humility or being humble. You know, I wanted to read you from this book, The Definition of Humility. This little booklet, From Pride to Humility, is an excerpt in a chapter written in a longer book by Stuart Scott. But this little book is probably one of the most powerful little books you could ever buy and read. The first 15 or 16 pages discuss the issue of pride, defines pride, and gives, I think, 42 or 44 manifestations of pride in the life of a believer, or anybody for that matter. But then he goes on to define humility. And he gives maybe 24 or, or 30 different expressions of humility. But what I find most compelling is his definition of humility. Listen to this. This is from page 17. Humble people are focused on God and others, not on self. And even their focus on others is out of a desire to love and glorify God. They have no need to be recognized or approved. There is no competition with God or others. They have no need to elevate self, knowing that they have been forgiven and that God's love has been undeservably and irrevocably set upon them. Instead, a humble person's goal is to elevate God and encourage others. What a powerful definition of humility. Humble people are focused on God and others, not on self. They have no desire to glorify self. They have no desire to elevate self. In fact, all that they do is designed to bring glory to God, to give credit to God, to honor God, and to serve other people. Being humble doesn't mean that you're a doormat, that people walk all over you, but being humble means that you are actively using your gifts and abilities to advance Christ's kingdom without wanting recognition for it. You're using your gifts and abilities to advance Christ's kingdom and Christ's purpose without wanting or desiring recognition. And humility is a quality that is described often in the New Testament. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Uh, Paul says the right way to relate to one another in the church is to put the interests of other people ahead of our own. And this involves an active, not a passive, effort to put others ahead of oneself. Um, Do you want peace in your marriage? Peace in your relationship with your siblings? Consider putting your spouse's need ahead of your own. Consider putting your brother or sister's need ahead of your own. When you begin to put the needs of others ahead of your own, it cultivates peace and unity. And you know what? That person often reciprocates. You end up getting more of what you want when you put others ahead of yourself than if you would demand and insist that you have your own way all the time. It's true. Try it. If you don't believe me, try it. In the New Testament, we are to serve others without expecting to be recognized or compensated. We are to have the mindset of Christ who did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, it didn't matter that he was equal to God and he shouldn't walk around on red carpet his entire earthly ministry. No, but he he humbled himself and he took the position of a lowly servant. And he lived a life as an example for us and as a testimony to the Jews of God incarnate. And he did that so that he could end up at the cross. 
and suffer one of the most humiliating deaths of all time. And Christ was willing to humble himself and to come to earth and live among all kinds of wicked people and to be reviled in all kinds of awful and terrible ways. And he was willing to suffer and bleed and die on the cross so that he could pay the price for all sin of all people of all time. When he shed his blood on that cross, it was the payment that satisfied God's wrath against sin and he opened the floodgates of heaven to anyone who would call upon his name and confess their sin and believe in him. And God is faithful. He did not leave Christ dead. He did not leave him to rot in the grave. He raised him from the dead on the third day. And with that, proved that the power of death and sin could be broken. And so those who put their faith in the blood of Christ would not be hopeless when it came to their time to die. God would raise them up when they die, just as he raised Christ up when he died. Humility is a powerful and important virtue. And Peter says we should clothe ourselves with this towards one another. This is how we act towards others in the church. Humility characterizes our interpersonal relationships in the church. And then Peter goes on to give a motivation for humility. He quotes an Old Testament passage, For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Here's the motivation for humility. God is opposed to the proud, but he will give grace to those who are humble. What does this mean, God is opposed to the proud? Well, if you are filled with pride, you say things like this, I can do all things through my own strength. I will seek all the glory and honor for my own accomplishments. I control my own destiny and my own future. Pride, ultimately, is a rejection of God and his sovereign, providential, and loving care for us. Pride says, I don't need God. I can do it myself. Now, if we had time this morning, I'd love to read you Daniel chapter 4. Some of you may be familiar with Daniel chapter 4. It's the story of King Nebuchadnezzar who was made great over the kingdom of Babylon and who was warned by God in a dream to not exalt himself and to not manifest pride. And Daniel interpreted this dream for the king and said, O king, please humble yourself so that this horrible thing that has been predicted doesn't come true. And I think the king listened for about a year and after a year, he was walking on the, uh, the wall of the, the castle or the palace, and he looked out over Babylon and he said, isn't this Babylon which I have built? And at that moment, the dream came true. All that was prophesied. And he was relegated to the field for seven years. And at the end of seven years, he repented. And what did he say? I'm not worthy. I now know that God, Yahweh alone, is the one true God. And he has all power and all dominion and all authority. And it is he who should be exalted above everyone, not any man. That's a paraphrase, by the way. It's not exactly what he said. That's a great example of what happens when we build ourselves up in pride. God is opposed to the proud and he will find a way to humble you. But now, the motivation to be humble is this. God gives grace to those who are humble. Grace is God's generosity and kindness displayed to the individual. And for those who are humble, God's grace is apparent in how he strengthens them to do more than they could have ever imagined they would be able to do. Think of Moses. Moses was described as an extraordinarily humble man. And he did more than he ever thought he could by defeating the uh, Egyptians through the power of God by leading the Israelites out of Egypt and through the desert wanderings. Moses was strengthened supernaturally by God. Those who are humble 
will receive God's grace and how it empowers them for ministry that changes the face of the world. The Apostle Paul is an easy example of how a ministry changed the face of the world. But in the 20th century, there was another humble man whose ministry changed the course of foreign missions for a couple generations. His name was Jim Elliott. He was so humble and had such a great love to see this particular group of Indians saved in South America that he was willing to give his own life. And in being willing to be martyred for the faith, thousands of people were inspired to go to the foreign field and his ministry was multiplied by five or 10,000 times or more. More than he could have ever done in his, his life. But he was a humble man and God empowered him for a ministry task that changed the face of missions in the 20th century. Well, maybe that's not going to be you. Maybe it is. But another way that God's grace is apparent to the humble is that God often ensures that a legacy of faithful service impacts the next generation and the generation beyond that. How many of you heard about Christ through the faithful witness of a grandparent or a great-grandparent? Or maybe your parents are telling their grandchildren of Christ. See, to me, that's one of the most powerful legacies of God's grace to those who are humble, that there is a legacy of faithful service left behind. Now, how do we grow in this attribute of humility? How do we cultivate this? If it's so important, how do we do it? Verse 6 tells us, humility is cultivated by a right attitude towards God. We must humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. The command in verse 6 is to humble yourself. This means to think of yourself as low. What it, what it really suggests is that you have a proper perspective on who God is and who you are. God is the sovereign, independent creator of the entire universe. He depends upon nobody. You, however, are dependent exclusively on God. And so you must have a right thought pattern about the God who is the creator God of all the universe. God is high. God is lofty. God is powerful. God is eternal. God is unchangeable. God is almighty. You, however, you are not. And so you are going to Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. You are going to think rightly about yourself. And, and that doesn't mean that you're going to denigrate yourself. But what it, is, what it does mean is this. God, I recognize that you are great and I am small. God, the tasks that are before me today are beyond what I can bear. Strengthen me, God. God, what I need to accomplish to serve Christ I don't know how I'm going to do it. Please, Lord, make a way. You're going to have the attitude of not doing things in your own strength or your own power, but rather submitting all your ideas, all your desires to God, who is the God of the universe, and he will make a way for you that is the appropriate way at the appropriate time. This is what it means to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And if you do this, God will exalt you at the proper time. Now, we don't know from the text whether this is a present exaltation or a future exaltation. The text isn't specific enough to say. In fact, I don't really think that it matters when God is going to exalt you, but rather that God has promised to exalt you. If you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, God will exalt you when he wants to. And this exaltation is not so that we can bask in our own glory, but rather that when people notice what we did for God, we give the glory right back to God. Do you sing well? Do you play music well? Well, God has given you that talent, but if you're humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God, you're going to say, God has given me this talent and I just want to use it to please him and to bless his people. 
Are you a skillful mother or a skillful teacher or a successful businessman? God has given you those skills and talents and abilities, but you can give the glory right back to God. I'm doing this to bring glory and honor to God, the God who saved me, the God who created this entire world. So this is the first step of cultivating humility. Humility is cultivated by a right attitude towards God. We're going to recognize God's mighty power. That's the first step. And then we are going to entrust ourselves to God's providential care. This is verse 7. Casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. One of the unfortunate, um, one of the unfortunate circumstances that sometimes happen is we will take a verse like verse 7 and we'll pull it a little bit out of the context. And, you know, we can quote it, cast all your anxiety on God because God cares for you. That's good. But what is the context? Why? Why do we cast our anxiety on him? Because it's a way that you cultivate humility in your personal life. The word anxiety describes a feeling of apprehension or distress in view of possible dangers or misfortunes. Often we are anxious about things that we fear might happen but may not actually happen. In fact, that's a great portion of our anxiety. What might happen but hasn't actually happened. When we become anxious, we are worried about future events, but those future events don't often play out the way that we anticipate. John MacArthur notes this about anxiety. He says anxiety includes any discouragement, discontentment, questioning, fear, or pain that you might be facing now or potentially face in the future. You become fixated on those things. You become fixated on the discouragement, on the discontentment, on the questioning, on the fear. You're fixated on them to the point that you can't see anything else. What I found in the Luonida commentary was stunning to me. I had never read it before. They say in order to properly translate the word anxiety into some languages, you have to use an idiom, which is, not, which is a phrase instead of a word. And here's the phrase that they say translates anxiety. To be killed by one's mind. To be killed by one's mind. And if you struggle with anxiety, you know exactly what that's like. You cannot get out of, the, of your own mind. And, and here is how we cultivate humility. We entrust ourselves to God's providential care instead of trying to bear all these worries and solve all these problems through our own strength and ability. Amen. The New American Commentary says this, Worry is a form of pride because when believers are filled with anxiety, they are convinced that they must solve all their problems through their own strength. Effectively, the only God that they trust is themselves. And so we, we, we read this 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. We use this verse to encourage one another, and that's good, but we need to understand what is the larger context? What is the main point? If you want to be a humble person, if you want to grow in humility, you must learn to not hold on to your anxieties and solve them yourself, but you must learn to give those anxieties to God. Casting them means you take them from your hand and you throw them to another person. Just like if you were on a boat and there was a person standing at the dock, you would cast the rope to them and then you entrust yourself to their care because they have the rope. That's what you're doing for God. You're casting all the things that are outside of your control to God and his providential care. I want to read to you from Luke chapter 12. This is probably in Peter's mind as he was writing this. Luke chapter 12, verse 22. If you want to follow along, you're welcome to. Luke chapter 12, verse 22. Jesus said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat 
nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? And who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life's span? If you cannot even do a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? I mean, Jesus knows how to cut it straight. Knock it off. Quit worrying about all these other matters that are outside of your control. Give those things to God. And you need to take your thoughts captive. If you're, if you're somebody who struggles with worry or anxiety, take your thoughts captive and refuse to bring them to the front of your mind. Refuse to do it. A great expression of humility, then, is entrusting what you cannot control into the hands of our great God who controls everything. Let me say that again. A great expression of humility is entrusting what you cannot control into the hands of our great God who controls everything. And I'm not going to lie, it's far easier to say than to do. I don't doubt the struggle. I deal with it myself. But we must, through practice, cast these anxieties upon God, for it cultivates humility. It results in a right relationship with God, a right attitude towards God. Now, what is the benefit of humility in the local church? What is the benefit of humility in the local church? If we are practicing humility towards one another, what benefit is that? It's tremendous. It produces unity. It produces moving in the same direction. It produces a willingness to work hard for the kingdom of God and for the glory of Christ. It helps to stomp out resentment and bitterness and frustration that can cause cracks and fissures in a body. Humility is key for the local church, and this is why Peter says that all sheep, every sheep who is a sheep of Jesus, the chief shepherd, must practice humility. So let's encourage one another to do that as we move on from this particular text. Let us encourage one another to practice humility. What shall we say then as a result of these things? I'm actually going to summarize a conclusion from um, chapter 5, verse 1, all the way through chapter 7. God has given us instructions on how to conduct ourselves in the local church. God has done it because he is a God of order, not a God of chaos. And we must ask ourselves, am I fulfilling the role that God has given to me? Am I growing in the character and the qualities that I should be growing in according to God's instruction? I'm sure we could all answer yes to some degree, but we could redouble our efforts to do better at these things. Let us do that, church. Let us do it with joy and gladness, knowing that we serve a great and mighty king.